just come over to the microphone and say, welcome to the show. Welcome back to the Side by Side Guys Off-Road Podcast. I'm Big Z. I'm Ian with Full Throttle Battery. And we are excited to be back to you with a special guest. We have somebody that has not been uh, traditionally in our little ecosphere, but uh, we reached out and uh, reached out to the America's Favorite Redneck from Redneck Racing. We have Hubert Rowley. Is it Rowley or Rowley? Roland. Roland, sorry. <laughs> I was thinking Ronda Rousey. I was thinking, you know, you got some you got some muscle over on that side. Uh, but we're glad to have you on the channel. Uh, we have uh, a lot of questions for you. You have an extensive background um, in the off-road world and in the uh, kind of the extreme sport entertainment world. So we're super excited to dive in with you. And uh, why don't you uh, kind of give us a little bit of a background, who you are, where you're at, what you're doing. My name's Hubert Roland. I'm from uh, the hills of Middle Tennessee. I'm 37 or so years old, I think. Uh, sometimes I forget. I'm a certified mechanic through Wild Tech, through motorcycles, and I work for Travis Rana and Nitro Circus. Um, I'm here at Pastron Land. This is where I call home basically nine months out of the year. Uh, and I keep this place running between working on bikes and side by sides and four wheelers and trails and tracks and ramps and kind of a jack of all trades. Uh, I help keep him running and then Nitro Circus, when we do filming, I'm part of that, whether it's personality or building things or fixing things. And then I do side-by-side -side stuff on my own as far as adventure rides and trail rides and racing and mechanical videos and all that kind of stuff. So got a lot of stuff going on. Yeah, I got to imagine with the crew you're hanging with, uh, you know, there's a full, full time job, which is 40 hours. I got to imagine you're probably putting in some overtime given the nature of what goes on at that place. Yeah, it really depends on the time. Um, if there's an event coming up, like filming, of course, there's preparation for that event. And there's the film crew that comes in and personalities that come in. And most of the time, stuff gets tore up. And then there's the aftermath fixing uh, once they're gone. And then the in-between time is more just kind of maintaining and getting things ready for the next time. <laughs> so a never ending circle. So for everybody watching, uh, you can see in the background, uh, Hubert's got uh, some Can-Ams and a bunch of uh, garage stuff, even a, a vert ramp. Uh, this is not a fake uh, Skype background. This is not uh, <laughs> one of those picture replace things that have been going around. He's actually a, a Pastrana land um, kind of a, uh, uh, native, like you're, you're there actually throughout the year. And uh, what's what's that kind of experience like? So I've been helping Travis around 16 years now. And um, just just on the short, like how I got here, being a certified mechanic, I was a mechanic for a, a pro women's race who raced against Jolene, as, who was on part of Nitro Circus. And then through them, I met Travis and they invited me here just because knowing a lot of the same people. And when I came here 16 years ago, there's just broken stuff everywhere. And my mindset is I like fixing things and this stuff shouldn't be broke. So I just started fixing things and uh, they kept calling me back and I basically never left. <laughs> so here we are. <laughs> but yeah, this is the shop. Uh, like I say, I'm here roughly nine months out of the year and I'm, I'm a phone call away for him, text or phone or whatever. I have been on the other side of the country doing something and get a text or a call and say, hey, we need to get this done. Uh, within the next two weeks and I'm on a plane within three days back here getting things fixed wow. and ready. So that's, you know, part of the job and I love it and I wouldn't be here. Uh, actually, I just say if I didn't love it, I'd be doing something else. I stick with what I love. Yeah. I imagine you were fixing uh, a whole bunch of yellow stuff when you first showed up and it looks like more orange is going to be showing up to the party. Yeah. Yeah. We, uh, he's swapped over from Suzuki to can -Am, I mean, from Suzuki to KTM. Uh, some M's in there. And the biggest thing is the two strokes. He's a two stroke person. He's loved two strokes. That's what he grew up racing, riding. He never had to transition to four strokes. So, you know, he never really had to learn those bikes very well as far as riding. He can ride anything, uh, ride, drive, anything he gets in, he can run the wheels off of it and be very, very competitive. But he wants to stick with two strokes and Suzuki doesn't offer those anymore. Uh, and Roger DeCoster, that used to be Suzuki factory team manager now is over the KTM. So it was just a natural fit. He just talked to Roger and Roger said, yeah, you know, try some bikes out and if you like them, we'll work something out. And here we are, we got KTMs. 
So when you talk about uh, him enjoying two strokes, that segues me to whose idea was it for the straight rhythm to run the 500? <laughs> <laughs> well, that was, as far as running it, that was running the race was kind of a separate deal. Like he just liked the idea of a 500. And so we took a 450 that we had basically gave the rolling chassis to, um, a place that builds 500s. Uh, it's Service Power Sports, which the guy that started the whole 500 thing, uh, he's since then sold it. So it, you can't really even get it anymore, mostly because parts have become very hard to get as far as on the 500 motors. Um, but we gave them a rolling chassis and they they built basically a brand new motor from Parts Fish and, you know, kind of edited the frame, chopped some pieces, moved the mounts around and put a 500 two-stroke motor in a Suzuki frame. And he just wanted to think it would just be awesome. And then Red Bull got wind of it and said, well, you know, we're doing straight rhythm. We'd love for you to come be part of it because he's a Red Bull athlete. So it all, it all tied in together. And then this past year, uh, there's a company in Canada that makes an electric start kit for the 500s. So we reached out to them. Uh, we bought one from them and I installed the electric start kit on and we have some other guys that help, you know, do different things within the bike to make it do the very best it possibly can between suspension and chassis and all that kind of stuff. So now he's got 500 with electric start. He absolutely loves it. <laughs> he, so, we all get loves electric start. So, you know, looking back at where you guys got started together, that wasn't primarily in dirt bikes, right? Like there wasn't really a whole lot of um, wide variety of vehicles outside of maybe trucks and, and various different units uh, around that time, you know, 15 plus years ago. Uh, so what was the environment like with all those motorcycles and, and what was kind of the mindset behind what you were doing there? Yeah, you're correct. Like when you come around here, um, so that was roughly 04. Uh, so that's before... A, almost all the sports have the sides and you know the rhinos were out and such as that so we we weren't even in that game uh it was all dirt bikes uh maybe a couple cruiser motorcycles and then four wheelers to run trails and stuff like that and that was it so you know it, it was there was a lot to do because we had like probably nine rn 250s here and but each bike had a purpose so we didn't have to swap things on one bike every single time. We kind of, this bike was for this, this bike was for this, and kind of run, run down the line and some spares just in case. Um, we've transitioned to where he's got three uh, X3s, and then I have two X3s, and then the little sport back there. Um, so that's, like, my stuff doesn't, doesn't get run as hard or as often as his does. <laughs> he, he loves his X3s basically to give terror rides. You know, it's the closest thing to a rally car he can drive without being in a rally car. Uh, but in the early days, it was. It was all motorcycles. It was, uh, you know, mini bikes, big bikes, and four-wheelers. So it was very relatively simple. And everything was pretty much the same. So, you know, we you've got nine RM250s. Well, they all take the same parts. Very, very simple. Um, you got three or four 110s, well, they all take the same parts too. And the four-wheelers are the same way. So it was, we're basically only carrying parts here for basically, you know, three machines. And that's it. Um, very, very simple. So now between having the KTMs, um, they're relatively the same. We have a couple different models, but, you know, a wheel's a wheel, a tire's a tire, you know, little things like that. The stuff that you really wear out, chains, sprockets, tires, tubes, that's very, very simple. Uh, motor work, we don't really put enough time on them to really have to really worry about that. Uh, 110s, we just had a huge 110 race that was aired on ESPN2. Uh, we had 21 brand new KLX 110s that was purchased just for the race. And the, the teams took one bike and we sold the rest and kind of that kind of helped pay for everything, no big deal. Well, the 110s nowadays, we just handlebars and that's it. We don't change anything else because there's no reason to. Uh, it keeps the racing very, very fair. And Travis swears people cheat, but he's three two hundred pounds versus the guy that won is a hundred pounds and five five. So power to weight ratio, I think there's a little bit more to it. But yeah, it's it's much more complex. You got to carry. You know, I, I stock quite a few parts here, more so kind of just in case parts. Uh, you know, maybe some diffs, transmission oil, and belts and stuff like that, as far as the side by sides, and then 
the bikes, nothing's really changed. You know, a bike's a bike. They're very, very simple. Yeah, he uh, <clears throat> hearing you were talking about having uh, parts available for a handful of bikes, he used to do a lot of stuff on 125s. Like, I know he's got a national championship on a 125, Supercross championship on a 125. Correct me if I'm wrong. Didn't he race Erzberg on a 125, the Erzberg uh, rodeo? Erzberg was on an RM250. Oh, cool. He's basically, when he won the championship on 125s and kind of bumped it to 250, he really didn't mess with them too much after that. Um, once he kind of got on 250 full time, he kind of stayed there. Now, we've always kept a 125 or two around. And just because they're fun to ride, they're light, you know, you could just basically hold them wide open. And for him, it's hold it wide open and just wait for something to happen. Uh, <laughs> for all of us mortal people, it's like hold on for dear life and hope something doesn't happen. <laughs> so, you know, looking back, you know, first question is kind of how big was the whole compound when you first started and what is it, how has it evolved over the years with the different machines and, and kind of what were some of those milestones that you remember looking back at what really changed the game for you and what you're doing there? The property is the property. Like it, he has 20 acres and it's kind of a big rectangle. And then the neighbor next door, him and his kids drive, they've got about 40 roughly acres. And then the neighbor past him that borders the power lines, they have about 40 or so acres the guy next to the power line, he's the one that has a motocross track off of the woods. And so if you see the videos of Travis on the bikes or in the Can-Ams, it's usually over there where we change the track just for a video. Uh, as far as like our side-by-side loop, it, it spreads between the properties and it's pretty fast. It's kind of a down and back with some switchbacks and, you know, fast, low high speed jumps, uh, such as that. So like the side-by-side track course, kind of whatever those trails you know, they, they came into play in the past four years. Uh, the motocross track, it's kind of been there forever. Uh, so it, it's just been changed over the years. You know, I've, I've moved the same dirt. I bet it's something times. Uh, I mean, if you were to put like 300 truckloads of dirt and just move it around the field for the past 15 years, that's basically what I've done. <laughs> So I was going to ask you about that. You have an extensive history of uh, being the guy that makes these jumps and makes these different apparatuses that they fly off of around there. Um, what goes into figuring out how to build the ramp the right way and figuring out the right approach angle and the right launch and the right landing and all that kind of stuff? That's something that a lot of us in the community are always thinking, oh, I could do that if I had property or I do have property. I, one of the, I'm going to put a jump back there. You know, What kind of thought process goes into all that? The jumps and the dirt work and all that kind of stuff. Um, the one section on the property here, uh, the open section where the pit bike race was and all that kind of stuff, you know, that's always getting changed kind of depending on what's coming. And then, you know, depending on what we're going to be filming or whatever is kind of what we build for. So if we're building for side by sides or pit bikes and dirt bikes are a little bit easier because the pit bike or dirt bike, you, you can move your body weight around and make it fly kind of correctly how it should, where a side by side, anything four wheeled that you're driving with a steering wheel, the effect is however it leaves the ramps, how it's going to fly. Um, and that's really all there is to it. Now we see, we all see the videos of online of people hitting stuff and it bucking and seeing the little post of like my friends going down and whatever. Well, I can tell you firsthand, like you watch all of our videos and stuff, everything we have flies flat and it flies fine. The reason your side by sides don't fly good, it's the jump. And a dirt pile in a field is not a jump. <laughs> I don't care what you say. <laughs> we found this jump and we're trying to jump it. It's not a jump. It's a dirt pile. So uh, a lot of this comes from experience. Uh, dirt bike stuff, you build that a certain way. And because your body, you can move around and make it work. Where side-by-side -side stuff, you have to think of more of a four-wheel aspect and the way the, the jumps and everything are built. You know, it's totally different. Um, some of it is from past experiences like a Red Bull and the New Year's jump where he jumped a rally car. Uh, some of it's from distance jumps that, that I've built and we've experienced. So a ton of it's trial and error, but over time, the trial and error, we write down what works and make note on what doesn't work so we don't build that again. So, yeah, I mean, it, a lot of it's experience, you know. And I'm not saying, like, anybody can – there's – tons and tons and tons of great equipment operators out there that can probably run equipment better than me every day of the week. That's fine. But they don't have the experience in building jumps. 
So that's where the difference is. Like they could run a dozer every day and they could build something if you sit next to them and, and adjust and adjust and adjust where when we build, we roll in, build it and walk away from it and it's fine just from the experience part of it. And there's under a hundred people in the world that do what I do as far as jumps and tracks and stuff like that as a, as a specialty. So I have a farm and you're welcome to come over anytime and I'll just rent you a dozer and she's all yours from there. <laughs> so yeah, right. You have no idea how many times I've heard that. I, I believe it. So when you talk about trial and error and figuring the stuff out, I mean, <clears throat> when we're talking about side-by-sides, you know, trial and error on a side-by-side could be a $40,000 mistake. So, you know, what, <laughs> what kind of trial and error are you doing with a, with a machine that big? Just over the years, we know exactly what works, like very simply. Uh, we have some metal ramps back there that we have had built for other things, for cars and stuff like that. So a side-by-side is basically a smaller car. So when I say trial and error, like if we're trying to fly 100 feet to basically a triangle landing, you know, like that, well, um, you don't start at 100 feet. I mean, we know roughly how fast it should go, and we'll pull out radar gun and stuff like that. But trial and error is we push it up closer, like 40 foot, and jump it, and then slowly scoot it back and kind of gauging the miles per hour until, okay, we we know we need to fly 100, 120 feet, and we know it takes exactly this speed consistently every single time. Like nearly eyes closed, it'll do it every single time because – Again, it's not like a bike or nothing. You're sitting there, and as long as you throttle correctly and throttle correctly in the air, it's going to do the exact same thing every single time. Um, driver error is the biggest reason why side by sides get broke and why they get crashed is because driver error. I don't care what anybody says; it's not the machines; it's the driver. <laughs> so when you're when you're saying that you start up close and you work work your way back, when you're talking about dirt jumps. You're talking about moving earth back further and further. Oh, that's it. That's if we're using our ramps and stuff. Cause it's easy to pick, just hook a chain to the ramp and drag it backwards, you know, 10 feet, 20 feet at a time. Uh, and like to someone that's not used to that kind of stuff, 40 feet a long ways. And okay. Yeah, I get it. Like this shop right here is 50 foot wide. So you're jumping over the shop, but this is all we do. That's all we've done pretty much most of our lives. So 40 foot's a very small jump. And doing 10 to 20 foot increments is not really a big deal either. Um, but yes, to the average person and rider, that that's a big deal. <laughs> so when you guys are looking at these uh, challenges for doing stunts and whatnot, uh, you know, you guys have developed some sort of like natural instinct to say you can look at it and be like, that's not rolled off enough at the top. That one's, you know, a little bit too steep at the entry, things like that. And, and you guys can pretty much walk up to something and judge it uh, for what it is b- before you even sit in, sit inside a machine or on top of a bike. Oh yeah, for sure. And a lot of it's my experience. I raced motocross for years, uh, was never great, but I tried. And then Travis's experiences. And of course he was one of the best in the world at one time. Uh, and we have numerous other stunt type people like that so they trusted me to build it and i'll build it and it'll be nearly correct right out of the gate if anything they'll just have me knock the top off just a little bit to make it look more appealing uh i mean like i can build one you know a a triangle like this and i know they're going to land down here and they do too but just physically seeing a, a, a square edge it plays with you a little bit so knock that little edge off make it look a little friendlier it's perfectly fine when they jump it of course they missed all of it but <laughs> you got you gotta do whatever it takes to make the riders and drivers comfortable that way it goes correctly looking back at some of your resume stuff you know that we can google up on the internet you know it shows things like arena cross and monster energy red bull all these different things how often are you working with those companies outside of you know pastrana land so like i tell everyone like travis and nitro circus they are first out of the gate I mean, because they are the reason that I'm here today doing what I'm doing. If I never would have met Travis, I'd be the same old hillbilly back home, mechanic in or running heavy equipment every single day. And I love that kind of stuff. That's that's great. But they're the reason I got here. So they're always number one. Uh, and they're actually number one compared to a lot of things that like family and friends and all that kind of stuff. I miss numerous family events because of other events going on and I was like, look, this is, this is life. This is how I, how I make money and they rely on me and I rely on them. So that's always number one, but we do have slow seasons and 
slow times in between events. And I, I know nearly, nearly everybody in the world that builds tracks I know or know of. And so relationships with them, if they have help or they need help, they'll give me a call. And if my schedule is free, I'll go help for a week or so and come back. And if, um, if it's in a planned event, like X games or something like that, we just plan around it, you know, not really a big deal. You know, an X, an X games build is that's three weeks. That's a week and a half before the week during, and then a week after the cleanup. So, you know, you, you just schedule it out and plan it just like anybody else. So you touched on kind of making those compromises to get the, to get the job done. You, uh, you got to do something for yourself and it's number one on my bucket list and that's the Trans America Trail. So having been around some of the most incredible feats in action sports, if you compare that to seeing the ocean after a long trip like that, coming out, uh, basically, I think, didn't you connect to Highway 101 right there at Port Orford? Like, what's what's that feel like once you put that to bed? And, uh, you know, what, two weeks on the road, something like that, and then all of a sudden, goals accomplished. Like, how, how did that feel? I, I could say the Trans-American Trail was, was, a, was a very fun journey, and um, it, was, it was a great feeling at the end. Um, the original way that whole thing kind of started was I got some friends that live in East Tennessee, kind of near Windrock and all them areas. And I ride up in the mountains of them. And this guy, he was telling me that him and his buddy rode trans American trail on dual sport bikes. And that's really what the trail was kind of routed around is dual sports. And he got to tell me about it. He's like, Oh yeah, it's from North Carolina all the way to the Oregon coast. Uh, he said, we did it in about two weeks. He said, we were going to rent a U-Haul. We got back and load the bikes up. And he, he said, well, we got there and said, heck with it. We got on the interstate and rode the bikes home. So uh, <laughs> I was like, well, that's pretty cool. And I started, you know, talking to, you know, local buddies that I grew up with back home. Because, um, like, Travis and Nitro and all that kind of stuff, that's not really extreme enough for them. Their audience just expects very extreme type stuff, you know, flips and world's first and stuff like that. And that's fine, you know. Everyone loves watching that. Not everybody wants to be part of that as far as trying it. Um, but after kind of researching with my buddies, I was like, yeah, we can go buy like a couple of used dual sports and, and go do this. And, you know, it'd be awesome. And it, it wouldn't cost a crazy amount of money. And then, you know, they, they all love the idea, but work and schedule and families and, and stuff happens. I get it. That's fine. And then I started looking into, I was like, well, has anybody done it in a side by side? And I started doing some research and, I'd only found people that had done like little sections of it. And then I found some videos uh, from Johnny Angel that owns UTV Inc. He did it in, I want to say 2011 in 900s. Um, and he did it kind of on his own, but he's got his company that can kind of push, push some marketing towards and stuff like that, you know, and he just did it because he wanted to. So him and some buddies basically got dropped off in North Carolina and took it all the way to Oregon. So I, I got a hold of him. And at that time, he was doing Razor stuff and I was doing Razor stuff. So I knew a lot of mutual people. So I got a hold of him and I talked to him for a little while about it. And um, he gave me some kind of pointers on what he kind of looked at, like what he would do different or how he did it. And it worked out very well. And so I was like, you know, I, I'm probably going to try it. And he's like, hey, man, good luck. I hope it goes well but I hope you don't go as many miles as I did. Uh, it, it's all in the competition type. I was like, man, I appreciate it. Um, yeah, for sure. Hopefully it goes well. So then we started, I started looking into it and I have a lady that kind of helped me arrange a lot of that stuff. My mom helped me with the mapping. We went to transamtrail.com. Uh, that guy, he actually is the one that mapped the whole thing and made it very, very public. So I bought all the maps from him and I bought all the GPS files from him and I loaded them into an iPad using lead nav. And I, my mom was just dying to help. So I gave her my iPad and I gave her all the paper maps. And I said, I need every, every mile point off this paper map put on the map file. And I need gas stations. And I need day stops. Cause we're going to go roughly, you know, two to 300 miles a day, just depending on where we're at and you know what we can make. So she put every gas stop, every hotel that we needed to go to. And it was very simple. Like I could go to the iPad, I could zoom in and there's a hotel with the phone number on the screen and all I was do is call. Them. So, you know, my mom, I bet she had 80 something hours 
in the mapping of that thing just herself. And then working with Lead now, they help with the uh, live tracking all through a website. And he connected me with, um, what is it, Iridium Go, which is like a little satellite puck that pushes Wi-Fi. So I had Iridium that was pinging every so many minutes to a website that was moving us across a map, basically what we're doing. So we had live tracking and we had people actually come out and meet up with us. Uh, we were sitting there drinking in the Ozark Mountains, drinking some waters and just taking a break. And here comes a guy flying down the trail in a general. He comes sliding up beside us. He's like, I saw your morning post. I knew exactly where you're at. We want to come ride with you. I said, well, yeah, you're welcome to come ride with us. That's fine. Uh, I said, it's not really super exciting. It's just driving. He's like, hey, no problem. We drove for probably three or four hours and we crossed over in Oklahoma and we stopped and get gas and the guys, you know, they got some gas and I was like, all right, well, you know, we're going to head back home. I was like, back home, where are you, uh, where's home? If we got there, he's like, oh, you know, that bridge you pass on and people swimming under it. I was like, yeah, that one about two hours ago. He's like, yeah, that's where we live. <laughs> so they just, they just love the trip. They just want to be part of it. We had a guy show up in a, in an old Chevy Blazer with his dog. They just wanted to follow for a little while. Uh, we had, you know, a, a whole group of uh, dual sport guys down in Mississippi that rode these old Honda Cubs all through the Trans-American Trail. And they just wanted to follow us for a little while just to say they did it. Uh, we had numerous, numerous encounters like that. It was very, very awesome. And uh, I want to do more adventures like that and make them public and let people just come out and ride. Um, but it kind of, kind of, we got kind of sidetracked, not really, but kind of. But like the experience, like driving to, because I connected it all the way to Myrtle Beach to make it truly ocean to ocean and called up some reps for WPS and places like that. And, you know, just got a hold of the right people and say, hey, can you track this road and make sure it goes to where my mapping says it goes? Because I don't want to show up and it's just not there. You know, it's a nine hour drive just to get there. And they verified everything and they helped us connect with the right people. And so my mom drove my truck and trailer and my buddy drove his truck and trailer and basically they dropped us off there and then they went home and we just started driving it was three utvs and a four-person crew and that was that was us for um, a month straight we drove nine to 14 hours a day for 29 days straight um and I, i'll tell you there's times that it sucked like we drove around Moab and we got some trails, but when we leave Moab from there, it was basically to the edge of Utah and Nevada border. And that was a 300 mile day. And there's sections of the desert. We're driving across there 40, 50 miles an hour. And it's 100, 110 degrees. The sun's beating you so bad. Well, you can't just stop because if you stop, like you're not making any progress. So you just have to let the sun beat you and just keep driving. And that was a, that was actually a nine hour day. Uh, we got tickets in Colorado uh, for crossing the highway like we shouldn't have. And that was a 14 hour day because they put us behind and made us reroute and all this kind of stuff. We got to the hotel the next morning at 1 a.m. And that was, uh, I had to be there. I had a schedule. I had to be this place every single day because Warfighter Made would send veterans every few days. And the veterans would fly and then Uber to a hotel. So they're waiting on us. So we're not going to let them people down because they're the reason we're able to do this. So, yeah, the girl that was in Monticello, she was like, well, I got here with the Uber at like 10 o'clock and I didn't see any UTVs. And I was hoping y'all were still going to make it. And I was like, no, no, we got here about one. And then we woke up at six to leave again. <laughs> but as far as the, the experience, it was an amazing experience because – it's kind of like I was the first crew to ever do it as far as go UTVs, ocean to ocean. Now, people can say they rode the Trans-American Trail and they can say they rode a long ways, and that's great. But my crew is the first crew to ever go ocean to ocean in a UTV and fully drive. To me, that's pretty awesome to Nitro fans. You know, it's neat, but it's not as, not as awesome as a triple backflip. And I've helped be part of that stuff, too. So, you know, world first type stuff has become semi-common, but... It's super awesome to be and very humbling to be a part of it and kind of be one of the people to help kind of put it all together and make it all happen and then see it go through and then see the final product. You know, it, it really went very well. You know, that, uh, 
<clears throat> kind of the gnarly stuff that takes place on a UTV, I would say the vast majority of enthusiasts for UTV is venturing towards a trip like that. It that just seems like it's a it's an ascending market. You know, it's people that want to put they want to put some camp gear on their UTV. They want to find some pretty cool adventure rides. Like the one that uh, the one that that I try to take down a lot is the backcountry discovery routes, which are all done by uh, BDR dot basically ridebdr.com, Butler Maps. Um, it, I, I really think that five years from now, this is going to be really common. Guys camping off their machines, finding these pretty, I wouldn't say dynamic rides, but really scenic rides where they can go out and check out some scenery that they wouldn't normally be able to check out because these machines, I mean, you're talking about, I've got a Toyota FJ going down trails at five miles an hour because it'll beat the heck out of my machine, whereas my Can-Am will do it at 50, <laughs> you know? Yeah, and there's a ton of, of these trails that, uh, like we just did the Idaho BDR, which was like you know 1,500 miles for us to c- to complete uh, the border to border trip, and uh, there's a lot of things that come into play there, including you know what you're carrying, the tools, the supplies, the food, the whatever. It sounds like the Trans America you were doing a lot more uh, hotel hopping at the end of the day, uh, whereas we were doing a lot more camping at the end of the day. Um, you know, talk about that Trans the Trans Am about. Like, what was the the geography? Were you doing a lot of pavement? Was it mostly dirt? Like, how? What was? What did that look like across the country? On this trail, like before I even went on it, I called uh, Sam Carrero, the guy that I got all the mapping from, and I bought them from him, and you know, kind of asked him, and he said, "Man, it sounds amazing." Um, we went five thousand miles across country. Now, if we would have followed every single mile, because there was a lot of like horseshoes to where the trail would go like down around this hill and then back up. I would straight line certain areas just to stay on track of time. Um, if I would have stayed every single mile and not shortcut anything, it would have been closer to 7,000 miles, but we ended up 5,000 miles, like 5,000 exactly um, for the whole trip. Out of that 5,000, you're more on pavement in the East. Uh, once you get kind of past Arkansas, those are mountains, the mountain area, of course, that's, you know, mountain passes and gravel roads and trails and stuff like that. But once you kind of get past that, it turns into more dirt the rest of the way. Um, you're on you're on and off pavement, of course. But I would say pavement's probably 35 percent out of 5,000 miles, and most of it's in the east, just because the east has so much private property. Uh, you have to go around everything, and you have to stay on your little county roads and stuff like that. And we were tagged as far as we had tags, but. You know, there's been numerous posts about people tagging UTVs and stuff like that. And I'll, I'm going to push right into that and tell people firsthand, like, I had my machines tagged through Montana and places like Montana, Wyoming, South Dakota, North Dakota, stuff like that. They tag, and even Arizona and Utah, they tag their UTVs kind of free range for any road except an interstate, but they're really mainly towards county roads. But in those specific states, the population is just less and they're a little more lenient on it. Tennessee, where I'm from, they tag them, but our tag is strictly county roads only. And you can cross a state highway at a 90 degree angle and that's it. Um, and it's really, really handy for like out in the East Tennessee, Windrock and Brimstone, where the UTV trails are. You can kind of connect trails a little bit easier. Um, but for those that are saying like, oh, we'll get a tag and it's good for every state. Uh, it's not. Um, now, there, I know there's laws that you can kind of flex and fight against and say, oh, well, you know, but it's it's state. It's a state government issue tag and you should honor it. Well, maybe if you go to court, they're going to. But in reality, I learned firsthand on this this trail trip that just because you're tagged doesn't mean every state, every county and even every town is going to honor it. Um, we we drove very mellow. We kept the radios down. You know, we were very, very calm as we went. And I'm, I'm very conscious of that. You don't want to disturb anybody. Uh, don't make a ruckus and all that kind of stuff. And we were going out in places where the, the amazing part of it is we were in places that no one sees except for the people that live there because they're so far out. They're so far away from everything. So the odds of being pulled over as long as you're not acting silly are very, very slim. But the whole tagging UTV things and you're just instantly good for every road. That's false. It's not true. And for those that, that do really push that envelope very hard and that post videos like, Oh, I'm riding down the road and they can't do nothing. Cause I got this. 
Well, that that hurts it for everybody. That hurts it for us that are doing it, you know, legally, and it hurts it for people that they're trying to get their states to to vote on something like that. You know, if there's enough of those videos get out, it, it just kills it for all of us. At the end of the day, like these things aren't past the safety board like a car is. So in reality, they shouldn't be on the road. They don't have the crash ratings and all that kind of stuff. But as far as a little county road commuter, like going in between farms and trails and stuff like that, it's far easier to drive it than to be on a trailer. So, you know, for anybody that's thinking about that kind of stuff, just be very aware and be very cautious and be very thankful and respectful to everyone. And there shouldn't be any really issues, but you know, that's just my outlook on that kind of stuff. Um, no, I, I, I like that you touched on Sam too, you know, Sam's the pioneer of the trans America trail and he, uh, <clears throat> he gets a lot of love, no doubt about it from the dual sport community. And, and recently like the Overland community as well, you know, like the Overland Expo East is done out there in Asheville. I think they wound up moving it, but like Expedition Overland did a, did a trip back on the trans America trail and they took Sam. It's, it's cool to see him get the credit that he deserves. Cause that's, that's that's no easy task mapping that system. He was telling me that he rides it every year, like twice a year, just to edit the map on his by himself on his dual sport. And he actually met us down in Mississippi when we was at a, a stop. He came to the dealer that we stopped at, just at a little meet and greet and stuff, and got talking to him. And he's like, "Oh yeah, so once you go up Utah, he said I I changed the route to go all the way up to Idaho and then across Idaho and such as that." He said because years ago when the economy flopped in like 08, he's like, I couldn't consciously send people down the trail that cuts across the top of Nevada, going through little towns that didn't have much to begin with. And knowing that they're probably shriveled up and gone, I just couldn't physically send people through there knowing that there's probably no gas and good luck. So he actually moved the trail to go up further North and still get to the same end spot. It's just an amazing person and an amazing, you know, amazing mindset and just a great, great person. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to see a production company or something do maybe a little documentary on him. He's He's got one heck of a story to tell. So when you were talking about going these thousands of miles and having about 30% or so on pavement, you know, we, we did Idaho and uh, there was about 25% of that being, you know, pavement. That's really, pavement's like even more abusive to your machine than dirt is a lot of the times. Um, what was your experience with having a belt machine, you know, going that far, that long, nine to however many hours a day? Um, for you guys, were you going through belts a lot? I, I know there was a post at one point where they were saying you were a thousand miles or whatever in with a original belt, but you know, what kind of things were you thinking about on your machine that you had to maintain and have a cognizant like idea of while you were driving that, that long of a distance? The, the whole thing with this trip was I looked at it the same way we look at Travis's race bikes and the team looks at his, his rally car and stuff like that. You know, you, you prep it to never fail and because you're so deep into it you can't fail you know you don't want to spend insane amount of money and something silly go wrong in the first couple of days so preparation for his bikes i translate it right over into the side of sides whether i'm going trail riding racing or adventure riding whatever we always prepare to never fail um so you know changing certain parts whatever you know wheel bearings um, we did the whole trail on all original belts. Um, and a lot of that's how you drive, you know, people, I see the posts and stuff like that, people breaking belts and stuff like this and whatever. And, you know, they'll blame the machines. Well, we've got, we've got Travis's machines, which he's extremely hard on the gas and he don't blow belts. And I've taken machines over 5,000 miles and never blown a belt. So we've got two totally different aspects and we have the same outcome. Uh, it's all in hang of freedom. Um, of course, on the, the adventure rides, so like that, you know, it's just a smooth, steady gas and cruising along. So it's not a lot of strain on it where he's like extremely hard on the gas, extremely off back and forth. Um, we didn't really have any problems. We did have a couple flat tires, really. The whole trip, we had maybe two flat tires and that was it. Um, I ran tire blocks on the side of the tires. It adds a little weight, but I wanted to guarantee that I'd, I could keep running in case it cut or something like that. And we did have one that it cut on a sidewall and it cut far enough that, you know, nine plugs uh, still didn't fix it. (laughs) 
so we just uh, made it work and and actually like running tire blocks i didn't even carry any spares um and we didn't get that cut until utah well i had friends in utah that we were going to their house to stay we were only like a day away so it's nothing to drive another day on a tire with blocks in it because it lets it flex a little bit but it still holds up and it might pull a little funny but whatever you know we we made it all work so at the end of the day that's all we had was um a couple flat tires and as far as service work uh, i carried extra air filters and oil and stuff like that we did our first service in moab utah 2500 miles and we rolled out of my shop on factory oil uh, the only oil i changed was the diff and the transmission oil i run uh, 75140 gear oil just because it's made for gears and it's a little thicker and it'll last a little longer and when we drained it out in moab it was just as clean as what we put it in um so those that say the factory oil is not good well it went 2500 miles it was just fine <laughs> so when you talk about you know being prepared what kind of upgrade because you were driving a i think you guys had in your group you had a xp 1000 xp turbo and a general uh 1000 uh what kind of things did you guys change before you headed out the door so changing wise we changed i changed arms and ball joints and had graceful ball joints and a little bit heavier tie rods and radius rods just i know those things are they can be weak points so i went ahead and changed them uh, not like we were beating on them or whatever kind of a just in case type thing uh we run radio systems and um you know audio radio also just to have sound to listen to and stuff like that windshields uh extra lights turn signal kits um additional brake light storage on the back end to carry tools parts clothes you know food whatever and that's really about it you know it was all bolt-on stuff we put winches on all of them uh just in case you know someone getting in a bind and you end up getting two machines stuck in a third machine and stuff like that we had to use the winches once or twice um so yeah just very minor simple preparation after going through it all now and have done it i would take a bone stock can am and do it no issues whatsoever uh, the only issues you'd run into is probably a couple flat tires and you wear the tires out. But you're right, riding on the pavement, it does put a little more stress on things. Um, there's so much traction. Uh, they can't move as freely as they're kind of designed to. So we definitely limit our speeds to kind of help things last longer. Uh, sure, I mean, the machines will run 75 miles an hour, but they're not going to run 75 miles an hour with no issues for nine hours a day a month straight you know stuff's going to start vibrating apart and start coming loose um you know and if you prep it and pull it fully apart and lock tight and put it all together it probably will last but it's still just extremely hard on stuff to run those kind of speeds for endless hours so you know, just run smart you know kind of conservative and you also want to conserve on fuel um our turbo machine would go a tank and a half compared to the xp 1000 um and we did carry extra fuel and stuff like that. But those are things to think about, you know, when you're trying to go so many miles and you're out in the middle of nowhere, um, there ain't nobody can come help you. And you might not have a cell phone, cell phone signal either. On that trip, like what was kind of the signature moment? Like I, I, I know that trip goes through Colorado. Um, I can't remember if it goes through like Ophir Pass or where that is, but or where exactly it goes. But I know a lot of those passes up there were, are upwards like 12,000 feet and stuff. Uh uh, in terms of like a signature moment, moment, would it be Colorado? Would it be, would it be Moab? Would it be seeing the ocean? Like what, what was your big takeaway? Like what was the, the one where it was just like, yeah, I could do this again. I mean, every day had its, had its wows, of course. Uh, once you get towards, you barely cut through the corner of New Mexico and then you start getting into Colorado and then the mountains start appearing. And, um, I'll say it, it was pretty amazing to, to, kind of go through a mountain and kind of be able to look at the GPS and say, well, we're going over there and I know we're going to be over there. So we just ride and ride and ride, like, you know, three, four hours. But when you get on the next mountain over there, you look back and say, that's where we just came from. And you did it, you know, maybe three hours or so. So stuff like that was amazing and happened nearly every day, especially over in the mountain area. It was pretty wild like when we're leaving the ocean like 
wow, we're actually, <laughs> we're, we're going to do this. And then the very last day, that was probably the biggest wow um, for a couple of reasons. Like we kept hitting some dead end trails that have been logged and blocked. And we had to end up you know, kind of backtracking and going around some back roads and getting on some other gravel roads. And the last gravel stretch, it's all covered in pine trees and you could see the ocean in the distance. So we kind of ran to the end and seen it. And then we went back and I pulled the drone out and put it up in the air just to kind of watch us come out of the trail and there's the ocean. And that was wow, like, oh, holy cow, we did it. Well, then the truck that was meeting us, um, Pleasant Cook, which is 4 before Barbie on Instagram, she was a, a main part of this trip with me. And her mom and dad was meeting us there with a truck and a 40-foot trailer to carry everything basically back. And so, you know, I got a hold of him and I said, you know, well, I'll pay for whatever it takes, you know, to get you there and back and, you know, we'll help out. And he's like, yeah, no problem. So he, he was waiting basically right there. And the trailer was like barely down the road at a little parking lot. So he led us down there. We went down there. We parked the machines basically in the parking lot. We couldn't ride over the grass into the sand um, just because it's a, a park area and you don't want to go pushing the limits and stuff like that. And I look over at the beach and there's there's two ladies holding a banner of My Redneck Adventure, that basically the logo that I had made. And I, I was thinking to like, well, who are these Who are these ladies that y'all bribed to hold this sign while we're waiting? Because it was windy as can be, probably blowing like 30, 40 miles an hour. And uh, I walked down there and it's my mom and my aunt. And so my mom dropped me off at the ocean. And then my mom flew to my aunt's house who lives in Northern California. And they drove up to Oregon to see me at the very end. Um, so for my mom to be part of the beginning and the end of it, that, that was pretty amazing just in itself. You know, we got hugs and pictures and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, she went back with my aunt. We kind of continued on because we were heading home in some other places. But that was probably the most amazing part. Besides seeing the ocean, that my mom's sitting there waiting on me. Uh, and she was a fully part of the trip from beginning to end. That's awesome. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, there's not there's not a heck of a lot of people out there that have, have gone out and done a bunch of wheeling on the east coast and the west coast you know there's a big big contrast we get a little bit of flack every now and then on the show because we talk a little bit too much west coast riding so it's it's definitely nice having you on the show <laughs> that's a little bit of contrast to that <laughs> so what what would you say you know you've been on both sides now and you've been across the world on on what you do but uh just the the context of you know difference of riding on the east coast west coast down south southwest uh what would you say the biggest stark contrasts are when you're talking about riding the trails on the east coast you know maybe central america and in the west coast every place has its advantages for sure um weather is one you know you go in the southwest the weather is pretty consistent dry and hot uh, i'm not a i'm not a fan of the dust i mean you deal with it that's fine but I'm just not a big fan of it. Like I'd rather deal with mud than dust, uh, but you get in the Southeast, you don't need nothing but a garden hose to wash the machine. Cause it really only gets dusty. Now they have their little rain storms and stuff like that. And you know, that's all good. I love the Northwest stuff where y'all are at. I love riding through the pine trees. I love mountain riding, just riding in the mountains in general. Um, all up in the pines. It's like, yeah, it's really, really pretty up there. Of course, Colorado is, you know, similar to that, but bigger and steeper and stuff like that. Moab is its own deal. Um, but at the end of the day, I I love home. I, I love the Southeast. Uh, we have, you know, smaller mountains. We have mountains. We have green. We have mud. We have dirt. You know, we, we do have some sand here and there. We have rocks. Um, and that's kind of the East Coast in general. It's all very, very similar. Uh, as far as picking a favorite, I think we're all always going to pick our home. You know, home's always favorite because that's what you love and what you knew and what you grow up. But yeah, there's there's a, a lot of riding up there that people never never get to see. And I don't know if we just don't plan it or kind of scared to go out there, but I advise everybody to go out there and see everything you possibly can because there's amazing riding everywhere. Amazing people everywhere. Everyone, everyone is part of this, this whole off-road scene for the most part, it's all really good people and we all just enjoy the, the same thing. And that's what's really awesome about it. I think one of the most awesome things that we experience on the BDR trails that we've done is just meeting these little people in the small towns 
and the little mom and pop shops and there's the little souvenir shops and the little gas stations that are literally being ran out of their home. Like these little, these little communities that have 40 people in them um, are just simply amazing. Just the stories and the character that they have. Um, you know, there's a future that we all kind of agree on that this adventure writing is going to be a lot more uh, prominent as the years come by because people are going to get outside of their shell and realize they can get out and do more as long as they understand the scope of it. Um, and the return on that, on that is going to be huge. The reward on, on, on investing that time is going to be huge. And I think people are going to start to see that. Um, you know, and we've talked before about like these little communities, how much they stand to benefit on staying exactly who they are, but also understanding the communities that want to come through and meet them and, and be a part of it. Um, there was a community we drove through, uh, on the Idaho trail that was, they have a harmonica festival and, and we just missed it or, or COVID canceled it or whatever. But you know, that would have been amazing just to ha- <laughs> be in this like 40 to 60 people community and they have a harmonica festival in the middle of the mountains. Like, I mean, come on, how, how awesome would have that been? Yeah, we went through a lot of communities. We've been through a lot of communities, and for the most part, they're all pretty welcoming. But, you know, some of them some of them aren't, and there's usually a reason behind it somewhere. There's been a, an experience or or whatever. So, you know, where, wherever we go as far as off-roading, I, I advise everyone just to, to be calm and don't disturb people and just kind of do your little thing. And if you stay nice and calm and just be very respectful, you know, people will naturally take you in. Um, it's kind of just how it goes, but if you come out there and spinning donuts and, you know, going crazy and stuff like that, there's places for that, but not everywhere. And if you, you kind of do that too much, that kind of gives the name bad or puts bad taste in people's mouth. So you know, just try to be respectful is the biggest thing I can say. Yeah. I've got a, I've got a spot marked in North Carolina that all the, uh, Transamerica trail riders have mentioned saying you better be on your best behavior when you go through that. So I've thought to myself, well, if I ever tackle that thing with a side-by-side, I'll go through it three in the morning, super quiet. <laughs> to, to kind of change gears a little bit and gears was a pun. Uh, you, we've, uh, we've seen you kind of, uh, develop this program, uh, at Pastrana Land around Polaris razors. And, and that over the time has evolved into the different models starting, I think with the one thousands and then into turbos. Um, and now recently this year, you've moved into the Can-Am camp and you have a number of X threes and that, that cool, uh, Maverick sport back there. Um, can you kind of maybe get into some of the differences and what you're finding are some of the advantages of the, the Can-Ams that you guys are starting to use? You know, just right out of the gate, like there's all machines are great. You know, every machine has its advantages and they've, it's nearly become like the whole Ford and Chevy and Dodge thing. It's, it's kind of what color do you like? That's really what it is. You know, diehard Honda people are going to stick with a Honda and same thing with Polaris and Can-Am and Kawasaki. And, you know, it's, it's really what color you like. They're all built very well and it kind of just whatever matches you the best and so, yeah, we did, we did stuff with other brands in the past and we had some, some really close friends start within Can-Am and they kind of, they kind of opened the conversation like, Hey, you know, we're doing this and this now. Um, would you even think about looking into that kind of stuff? I'm like, well, oh, yeah, I mean, you know, you want to stick with your friends, you want to help your friends and stuff like that. So that's kind of, kind of the reason it, it went that way. And then, you know, the machines are awesome and they're going to, they're going to fit those who, you know, in, enjoy those machines. You know, they're, they do sit differently. Uh, they are built a little bit differently, but in general, they're, all the machines are built very, very similar. So it's, like I said, kind of what fits you the best. Um, the Can-Ams are built very well. Um, Travis's X3 that he thrashes on and gives terror rides with, I call, um, it hasn't broke anything yet. Um, he tipped over on his side one day and that's purely just driver error, trying to turn harder and harder each time. And it was very, very simple. Like if he would have had room to turn out of it, he wouldn't have rolled over at all, but we're kind of stuck in between trees. <laughs> so we gotta, gotta kind of make it work, but, uh, he's all stock and been running the dog crap out of it. And the only thing I've done to it is I've added like the sound roof and changed the ride height on it and done some little shock adjustments and that's it uh, my machines back here are like they've got can-am accessories on them like the sport has the power flip windshield and the audio system and uh harnesses and then my my x3 over here 
it's got, you know, windshield and a little spare tire carrier and the audio roof and, you know, just accessories and stuff like that. But we haven't really done anything to them really outside of that. You know, I run the Rhino 2.0 axles and that's more, you know, I work with Super ATV and I love their products and I, I just trust it. I know that that, that axle has gotten me through best in the desert racing. It's gotten me through King of the Hammers numerous times. It's gotten me through all kinds of trail stuff. I never have an issue. So I'm not even going to question it. Um, but to also see Travis run all the stock stuff and it not break either, that's saying that it's built, they're built very well. Um, and at the same time, like you come from one machine, you work on it, you know it, and you get on another machine. It, it seems a little complex, but once you pull it like all the way down, like my King of the Hammers car, I pulled it down to a frame. Uh, once you get it apart, it's like, it's just as simple. It's just a little different. Um, so, yeah, like I, I can't say enough good things about them. I love the way they ride. I love the way they sit. The X3s, they, they definitely sit more like a sports car. And if you, you know, y'all you, you probably know, you get into people that have rode other brands, you know, what well, I can't really see. Well, I feel like they're laid out like a sports car. You look across the hood instead of down on it. So you are kind of down in it and kind of part of the machine and you get a, a really, really good feel where you got the Maverick Sport and you do kind of sit a little more upright and looking down. Um, so it's all, it's all in preference and what you like. Uh, I advise everybody to get out and ride and I don't care what you're riding, whether it's a horse or a can am or a go-kart, you know, just get out and ride in general. Um, but definitely I love the machines. They're, they do great. So uh, given how much UTV is ascending, are we going to be seeing in the near future, maybe a redneck 199 out at Johnson Valley for the hammers race one of these days, pilot, co-pilot? Uh, <laughs> Uh, probably not. Like I've raced three times now. Um, I I didn't finish this year. Just it was my fault. It was a it was a DQ from a mis misinterpretation of the rules. You know, uh, no big deal. I wasn't mad. Uh, I I'll just go ahead and tell the whole story because some people talk to junk and some people don't. And, and just you know, to really to preface this, you went from Polaris to to the X3 like within a matter of a month or two. Uh, on social, it was like almost this next day, but on, I'm sure in your timeline, it was a, a month or two and you had total, totally tore apart your car and to, to figure it out, like you said, and then took it straight to hammers after that. Right. Yeah. That was basically the second X3 I had ever driven. Uh, I had drove one before a friend had one. It was the RC model and there, there was just things I liked about it. And I was like, well, that's, that's interesting. You know, I definitely look into that, you know, later on. And so I got it and had it I literally drove around my trails enough to kind of get it broke in, you know, get some heat cycles in it and pulled it down, you know, change things more so just for durability and knowing it's not going to fail. There's nothing wrong with a factory, you know, a factory car would, would probably do most of it, but you would beat it up pretty bad. And some parts might, you know, bend a little bit, whatever. So you, you just kind of make it a little bit tougher. Uh, like I say, they're great as they are. But took it out there and started pre-running and stuff like that. And, I, you know, right out of the gate, it, it went wherever I pointed it for the most part. And kind of have a background of rocks and crawling and muddy rocks here in the east. That helps. I'm not saying I'm great, but I'm not horrible either. We know how to make it go. But I'll say the first time we went to King of the Hammers, we go in some of them sections like that. And I was like, I can't barely walk through here. And you want me to take this thing through here? Like, there's going to be nothing left of it. And then you learn the right technique from being around, you know, the right people and stuff like that. Um, it works very, very well. So, you know, where are we going with that whole question? <laughs> where your, your DQ on uh, KOH. So the whole DQ thing. So we come out, I went, they have the little qualifying course and you can pay to qualify or basically you start after all the qualifiers. And there was a hundred and I want to say 20 UTVs. And UTV is one class, and that's it. I went out and I ran the qualifying course in practice a couple times just to kind of see it. I'm not going to beat the machine up real bad. Went out there and qualified. Thought I did pretty well. And I was in the top 20. Well, because I was in the top 20 as far as starting. <laughs> and then as the faster people got out there, I started drifting back. I started like 85th, which is not last. You know, that's not horrible. Um, started about 85th. So my co-driver, Rick Waterbury, he is a, he drives a 4,400 
and he's awesome for the rocks. He knows what goes where and all this kind of stuff, but he's also a pit guy for Phil Blurton and the No Limit team. So he knows the can ams very well, too. So it was like a perfect fit, and he's very cool, just awesome guy, very knowledgeable. So we get to taking off, and he's, you know, he's in my ear just kind of, here comes this and this and this, and we we get all the way out, we get all to pit one, come back pit one, we're, and, you know, this year we're coming down the back door, the big steep, you know, rock drop off. Well, we get down to it, and he's going to get out and guide me down it, you know, just kind of point me left, right, left, right, whatever. Well, there's two cars flipped over in the bottom of it, and there's three cars in front of me, and they're taking their time getting them flipped back over, and I was like, we're going to eat up an hour just sitting here, you know, waiting for people to get out of the way. I've been down it before. It's not a big deal. You just got to pick the correct line and the right angle, and you're fine. Um, so I get fed up, and I back up, and I go out and around the mountain, and I come back in the bottom of it. And my co-driver gets in and we take off. Well, I knew I was going to get radioed in. And as soon as I get to the finish line, here comes Dave Cole, the guy that runs the whole race. And he he's pointing at me and he's kind of mad, like, you're done, you're done. You're, you're DQ, you're DQ. And I, I learned that, like, they radioed that my co-driver took the tracker off and walked down and got back in. Well, we never took the tracker off. It was still zip tied to the frame where it was originally tied. Now, that's a good idea. And if that's going to be the idea, I'm going to get someone CrossFit and let them run that tracker through sections, and then I'll meet them at the top. But that's not how you do it. So whatever, we get up there, and he's 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 kind of pointing and he's kind of yelling, and I was like, and he, he knew who I was because I've I've known him for years. So I was like, okay, I'm sorry, I'm done. That's fine. And he kind of backed up as soon as I said that. And I was like, well, let's pull over here so I'm not in the way. And we pull over and he comes over and talk to me and I pull my helmet off. And he's like, man, you, you can't, you can't do that. And I was like, Hey, if I'm DQ, I'm DQ. That's fine. No big deal. I was like, I'm out here for fun. You know, it'd be nice to finish, but you know, it's okay. It's my fault. I did wrong. I said, I understood the rules as if you miss a point, they're just going to give you a time penalty. Well, that's true, but it's more for the desert area. So, like, if you kind of cut a turn a little bit in and you miss a point, we're going to dock you a little bit, not go around a whole obstacle. And I look at it as they're going to dock me 45 minutes to go around this, or I'm going to sit here an hour. Either way, it's going to be about the same. And he's like, man, he said, it breaks my heart. I don't want to, I don't want to DQ you. You know, I like it that you're here and it's always fun. I was like, man, if that's the rules, that's the rules. I, I broke the rules and that's fine. I'll go, I'll go back to the trailer. He's like, well, you know, I said, like, or you can just add some time and I'll keep going. <laughs> you know, no big deal. <laughs> and he's like, I tell you what, he said, if you drive out the pits, you know, nice and easy, you can go back in where you, where you came out and then you can keep going. I was like, you know what, man, it's been a while. It's hot. I'm kind of hungry. It's all right. I'm done. No big deal. I said, thank you for a great race. And uh, I'll see you next year. <laughs> and I went to the trailer, like no big deal. And uh, actually, I guess I was told later on, in the 4,400 drivers meeting, that's, you know, the biggest class there. He was, he was so happy that the way I took it, that he actually brought up my situation in front of all of them and say, you know what he did wrong. He admitted it. And he was actually very, very nice about it. And so, you know what, it's, it's my fault. He said, I've had drivers every single year, just cuss me up and down and scream at me. And he's the only person that was actually really nice about it. And said, you know what, it's my fault. It's okay. Uh, I'll just go home. And you know, he's like, I just hope that more people would take that into consideration. Because um, a lot of us may do wrong under the heat of the moment of trying to do whatever and you, you get off track a little bit or whatever. And you don't think about it. You're just in the mind of go, go, go. And then when they call you out on it, of course, you don't want to be the person that's wrong. But if you stop and think about it, you're like, oh, well, maybe I did do wrong. Um, you just try to be the big person and, and treat people the way you want to be treated. You know, that's that's my little DQ story. And uh, maybe it'll relate to some people. Maybe people will say I'm a quitter. I really don't care. I'm having fun either way. <laughs> There's, you know, some a big reason why we're all in this sport is because it's what we enjoy. It makes us happy and we can escape and we can live this life out on the road that doesn't exist in day to day life. And, you know, a lot of us forget that when we start getting into, you know, goals based 
events, racing and sponsorships and, and all this other stuff. We have this, this one track mindset where we have to get things done, done, done. And, you know, when you go into something with the positive attitude of I'm here to have fun, I'm here to enjoy it. Um, you know, that's, that's basically the mindset you end up having is, is it's okay. Like if that's the rules, I'm good. I was out here, I was having fun. And, uh, like you said, you, you got to see the people you enjoy being around. You got to enjoy the, the terrain you, that challenges you and, and, and checks that box off and, uh, and you move on because there's more fun things to do. It's not like the world's going to come to an end just because, you know, something didn't fail to materialize. Honestly, for me, the most fun part of the actual race, like the pre-running was fun and actually really cool. Like after the whole race was over, my cousin that lives in Northern California, uh, he comes down and watches every year. Well, he, I've seen him the past couple of years, but I've always been so swamped. And then as soon as the race is over, I leave. I stayed for the whole race this year. So my cousin came over to my trailer and I was like, hey, do uh, you got a helmet? I was like, I'll take you out and we'll go see part of the course and whatever. Because it was an off day, you know, after our race was over. So he he uh came out there and he's got a jeep cherokee and he does four wheel and stuff like that and uh probably out of all my family we're probably the closest as far as very similar mindsets and mechanical and off-road and stuff like that and i took him out and he went and got a helmet and we we ran kind of out towards pit one and then we kind of went through some rock sections and all that kind of stuff and um this machine is the first machine i've ever had that like it it felt really good in everything i spent you know, numerous days with Fox getting it right as far as spring rates and valving and stuff like that. And like 70 miles an hour through three foot whoops. And it, they, they weren't really there. You're just kind of doing this, you know, it, it dances around a little bit, but it's just doing its thing. And so I took him out through the whoops and doing that kind of stuff. And then through the rocks and he was like, Holy cow. He's like, this is what y'all race on. And I was like, yeah, I was like for 140 miles. I was like, we got eight hours to do it. And he's like, man, that's a whole new perspective on watching a section versus actually going through it and doing it. And even just riding, you know, passenger, I offered to let him drive. And he's like, nah, nah. He's like, I can't afford to fix this thing. But, uh, you know, that was super awesome. But the highlight of, for me, the, the race was like doing pit one, you know, running through sections like that, that extremely fast and machines working really well. And actually getting to pass people instead of being passed all day, it felt really cool. <laughs> like I could see where people get addicted to this. But at the same time, I'm a big believer in we should all, you know where you stand. And I know what I'm good at and I know what I'm not good at. And, I, and I'm good at doing what I do. I'm not a top racer like Phil Burton and all those guys. And not to say that someone couldn't be, but it takes a long time to learn, to learn all that they know. So just stick with what you're good at and just be happy with it. You know, I feel that a large majority of the population, they like watching racing, but not everybody wants to be a racer. First of all, the financial commitment and the mindset and the mindset, you're okay with getting hurt at times and you're okay with dumping money and you're okay with it not going right all to go for it going perfect. Um, not everybody has that mindset and that's fine, but racing is always fun to watch. And I'm a racer at heart, but I love just riding in general. <laughs> well, you know, there's been a lot of, uh, learning, uh, that we all have to do when we get into the sport. And, and some of us learn the first day when we flip it over and some of us learn the hard way, the long, you know, the long time getting the money pit going. So, um, you know, there's, it's just like any other big, you know, commitment. You, you have to take it easy and, and take it slow and figure out what you're going to do, uh, quickly and, and long-term. Um, but, uh, just to mix it up a little bit, what's your favorite food? Mexican. Mexican spoken like Mexican. a true racer, uh, favorite movie. I don't really... Uh, oh, come on. You're supposed to say Nitro Circus. Come on. No, probably Step Brother. I, I got one. Forgive me. Have you ever punched or kicked Johnny Knoxville or Jeff Tremaine right in the balls? <laughs> no. Oh, they're good friends, but I've never had two of them. <laughs> <laughs> That actually brings up a cool, uh, an interesting point. I was I was thinking about this last night when I was kind of looking through some of the old footage and things like that. Um, you know, Nitro Circus really got big. Uh, what was it, two thousand eleven, something like that, um, when that movie came out. Um, and uh, you know, there's a there's a big difference between what you guys did and what the the Knoxville camp did, right? Like you guys were all being crazy and doing insane stuff at times. Uh, but something that I've really respected about the nitro crew is that there's definitely like, uh, 
you could say there's a lack of maturity in a lot of what you do, but there's actually a lot of maturity in what you do. And, um, you know, can you kind of speak to maybe some of that dynamic on how that all kind of operates on how you guys come up with ideas and, and how things come about? We're compared quite often to the Knoxville crew and stuff like that because they were our producers when we were on MTV for the TV show. Before that, it was just DVDs after TV show went into a 3d movie and such as that. And then the live show started, um, the whole Knoxville crew, like they have, you know, stunts that, you know, people might think of time time, but there's really never going to be a good outcome. Like stapling post-it notes to yourself. There's no good outcome of that. Or, uh, you know, getting in a Porter John that's got slingshot bungee slipped to it and a crane. There's really no good outcome. It's just like, do you have the guts to try that? Uh, all of our stuff is very competition based. Uh, everyone's very com- competitive, and um, there is an outcome. The odds of you making it are probably pretty slim, but there is a good outcome of it. So <laughs> that's uh, that's kind of a different mindset. Um, people have asked Travis, you know, how Nitro Circus or why or what is it or all this kind of stuff, and he said at the at the end of the day. He's like, I want to hang out with my friends. We challenge each other to do stuff that we probably wouldn't normally do. So, you know, you're just kind of pushing on each other because you never really know what's capable until you try. And he said, that's really just all I want to do is I want to hang out with my friends and we challenge each other and kind of make that into a job and just show the world what's possible. And he's done very well. <laughs> that's, that's what we've, we've done. So um, that's, that's the general mindset. As far as maturity, ain't none of us very mature when it comes to filming and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, like we all have our priorities and our jobs and stuff like that. Like my job is to keep all this stuff going and running and the property and all that kind of stuff. And, his job is between rally car and family and the kids. And, you know, everyone has basically a normal style life job. Nitro Circus is just a planned job every so often. Yeah. Kind of as a, as a fan of both shows, it's like Nitro Circus is you're being entertained by watching somebody pull something off. Totally amazing. And jackass is you're being entertained by somebody failing miserably. <laughs> 100%. <laughs> so looking back at uh, kind of this crazy career that you've uh, developed and, and been a part of, um, you know, what are some of the, what's one of the biggest, just because we're a UTV focused show, what was the biggest UTV uh, thing that sticks out in your head? Like if you're in you're at a bar with a bunch of friends or, and I don't know you don't drink, but um, the, the idea of just hanging out with all your buddies around the fire, what's one of the first things that pops into your mind on, on like the last 10 years of doing all this? What, what stands out? The Trans American Trail is a big uh, is a big part of it. Um, just kind of that self pride of knowing first crew to to do something like that. Uh, that's kind of my own world's first, whether it's extreme or not or not, whatever. Um, I consider that a, a, a part of it. Um, you know, racing like King of the Hammers and stuff like that. You know, though I've not never really done very well. Um, just going and being a part of it and doing it. And, you know, it's possibly one of the hardest races in the world. Um, That's a pretty big highlight. Um, You know, a lot of it's the people you meet, you know, and seeing people. Um, I'm a fan just like everybody else, whether I may not show it emotionally. um, You know, I work for the biggest action sports guy in the world but I'm still a fan of people that he races against and stuff like that, you know, get to meet like Jimmy Johnson. I got to meet like Michael Jordan, you know, very, very quickly and not like they would know me ever again, but you know, those are cool little highlights that, you know, you, you get in certain areas and these people are actually into the same thing. You never would have got, think you got to meet them. Um, I would say this year, this year, the biggest highlight for me this year in UTVs, as my ex Larry was on the cover of Dirt Wheels. And just a, a, a quick backstory is, you know, I'm from the hills of Middle Tennessee. Um, 
I grew up on farms and stuff like that. A little bitty town. When I was in third grade, there was maybe 400 people in our town. Uh, no red lights, just a highway and two little stores. And um, uh, not to go crazy, but like my dad passed away when I was 12. Um, it's part of life. That's just how it is. You know, you, you just kind of forced to grow up fast. Me being the three, um, you know, during an adolescent stage in life, you definitely, I, I came out with a little bit of an attitude and my grandpa snatched me up one time and said, you need to straighten up. And from then on, it was straighten up um, because, you know, things change, life changes and you, you just got to adapt and make it work. Uh, but growing up with a, you know, a good family and all that kind of stuff, I remember the first $20 bill I ever got and I thought I was rich. You know, I was like, what am I going to do with all this? Um, but we grew up farming and stuff like that. And we didn't have extra stuff. We had just what we need. So like I had a bicycle and little toys in a sandbox and stuff like that. So as we get older, you know, I had like three magazines that I looked at for years and years and years, just these same three. And one of them was dirt wheels. And I think when I was probably 13 or so, my mom got me a subscription to dirt wheels. And that was the best year of my life. I basically waited by the mailbox every month for a dirt wheels magazine. And I knew every four wheeler in there, every tire, just just studied the stuff like way more than I studied schoolwork. Uh, then I actually got in trouble for taking dirt wheels to school a couple of times. But, uh, you know, dirt, dirt wheels was just kind of a highlight of my childhood. And, you know, not necessarily having a goal of ever having a machine in there, but just having a goal of like, oh, I'd like to have one of these machines out of dirt wheels one day. And went to mechanic school in 2000, got out, and things started you know, working for yourself and paying for your own stuff and kind of as an off-road person, off-road was a priority. There's no telling how many times I had a four-wheeler or a dirt bike that cost more than the truck I was driving around in. That's just, that was just my priority. And it's kind of still like that today. And some people would say that's silly and that's dumb and whatever, you know, it's whatever makes you happy, uh, whether it's horses or dirt bikes or cars or baseball or whatever, you know, it, it doesn't matter, whatever truly makes you happy. So, you know, that's kind of the backstory of the dirt wheels. I grew up looking at that and just think, just loving that magazine. And over the years, got getting to meet different people and, and know Keith at UTV Sports. And I knew some editors from Dirt Wheels and I knew some editors from UTV Action and, and you know, Dirt Bike Magazine and Racer X and all that kind of stuff. And being part of things that have been in magazines like Travis's 500 and, you know, Travis Racing straight with them and then Nitro Circus made in magazines stuff like that. You know, being part of those things is so awesome. But to actually have your own thing and not to be self-centered or secluded or whatever like that, but to have my own machine on the cover of a magazine that I kind of grew up idolizing, it's a pretty amazing feeling. Um I didn't even know it was going to be on the cover until someone else sent me a picture of the magazine they got in the mail. Like Dirt Wheels didn't even tell me it was going on the cover. Uh, I knew it was going to get an article and they said it was going to be some like a rock crawler article with other machines kind of around King of Hammer. It's like, Oh man, that'd be so, so, so cool. And then I get a picture and I'm like, Holy, Holy cheap shit. You know, I'm on the cover of dirt wheels. That's, that's <laughs> awesome. And so uh, I got a hold of dirt wheels and I was like, can you send me the files just so I can print out some, you know, a banner to hang up in my, in my shop? Because to me that goes right up next to Nitro circus and stuff, you know, just a pretty awesome feat to accomplish. And it's not unreal and it's relatively simple at the end of the day, but it's, that's the highlight of my year so far is the cover of dirt wheels. I talk a lot about, uh, rider safety and, and things like that. And I wanted to get into the question of kind of what would be your kind of takeaway for somebody entering this market? There's been a ton of UTV sales this year. They've pretty much sold out all the dealerships across the country. And I know that you've been a part of the let's ride campaign and, things like that. Um, kind of what would be your, uh, you know, handful of takeaways for any new UTV rider or maybe some of those guys that are just haven't been in it very long and haven't learned the hard lessons um, that they could take away about, you know, their machines, their their safety and, and kind of the, the general uh, idea of riding these machines out uh, and about. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because so myself and uh, a lady that helps me organize a lot of stuff, Kristen Ulmer, have started the uh, Let's Ride Power Sports Safety Program to where I, I basically I go to schools and bring a machine and we get a hold of local reps and dealerships and stuff and, you know, go straight to elementary school, middle school, whatever, 
and we set up in the gym and, you know, just give a speech about, you know, how fun power sports riding is, but the importance of the proper safety gear as far as helmets and knowing how to operate, uh, knowing how to operate your machine correctly and stuff like that. So, you know, we really push on that. This whole craziness, what's going on in the country right now is definitely kind of put a hold on it. But at the same time, you're right. I mean, power sports sales are through the roof. I talked to uh, Cernix the other day and they sold more machines last month than they did in half a year uh, last year. Uh, and machine sales are just blowing up, whether it's side-by-sides or uh, ATVs or bikes or you know, more like anything. People are buying stuff just because that's what's in stock. They might not even be what they want color-wise or whatever, but they're just, you know, I don't know when one's going to come in. I'm just going to go ahead and buy it. Um, so, you know, for all the newcomers coming into this, um, I, I really advise to, you know, always wear your helmets, wear, wear eye protection, uh, wear your seat belts, you know, gloves, long sleeves, long pants, you know, that's all, all very, very good stuff to wear. You know, motorcycles, you should wear a little more because you're a little more into the elements and more, more likely to get scrubbed up by trees and branches and stuff like that. So, you know, I advise every new person. What, what a lot of people don't know is so there's ROVA, Recreational Off-Highway Vehicle Association. Um, that's put together by a lot of the OEMs. And the, that's kind of their, their safety avenue. They want ROVA to help spread the safety word uh, as far as every new machine comes with a free rider safety course credit. A lot of people don't know that. And I've talked to some of the OEMs about that kind of stuff. So if you buy a new machine, ask about ROVA and a safety course credit. Every new machine comes with a free credit. Now, if you buy a used machine and that credit was never used, according to, you know, backtrack to that VIN number, you can still get that free credit. Um, and a rider safety course, I don't believe they're incredibly expensive. I think it's $200 or less. Um, and it just depends. Now, if you have a, uh, we actually work with ROVA and the ATB Safety Institute as far as just kind of connecting dots and spreading information and, you know, they love what we do and, you know, we're really trying to spread the word of, of safety. The, the biggest people in, I hate to say, but the biggest people in danger are new people or people that aren't around it very often. Uh, we ask kids, the, the best questions I ask kids, like as a group, uh, okay, so who here has power sports vehicle or who rides one? And there'll be a handful as they are, who knows someone that has one? So then nearly everybody raises their hand because everyone knows someone with a bike, a full or UTV, whatever. I was like, okay, so out of all you people, when you're out riding or something like that, and I was like, all right, well, hold on. So y'all ask how we do flips and so like nitro circuits. I said, when we film, we have paramedics and doctors sitting there waiting just in case something happens. Um, you know, there's a lot of reasons, but the biggest thing is keeping everybody safe. I was like, so that's just in case. I was like, so out of all you kids that are raising your hand, you know someone at riding or whatever, how many of you have a doctor or an ambulance sitting there waiting just in case you get hurt on the trail or in the field or whatever? Well, no one can raise their hand unless their parents are a doctor. <laughs> that can kind of definitely thin the herd a little bit. So I was like, you know, just taking that mindset, and that goes for kids, adults, everybody, you know, just taking that mindset, you know, take the couple safety precautions to keep you safe just in case something happens. Um, I think first and foremost, everyone should know how to operate the machine properly and correctly. And a lot of that is just seat time, just drive, just drive around and kind of know what it'll do and what it won't do and kind of how it leans and feels and all this kind of stuff. You know, learn that kind of stuff. Motorcycles, you know, you're, you're going to fall over and you'll naturally learn what keeps you upright. Uh, ATVs, you know, you can get, you fall off or UTV, you're kind of, you're in it like a car. So you may not realize something's going wrong until you, know, you nearly can't get it back. Um, and I don't, don't say that in a negative way, but everyone I think should learn their machine very, very well and know it. And so the, the whole safety course is basically teaching you the basics on how to handle your machine in the correct ways and also wear the correct gear. Um, biggest thing is helmets and eye protection. And then everything else is, is not really required, but definitely advised. Um, you know, we definitely definitely push towards that. So you know, power sports safety is huge and newcomers need to, to take it serious because you, you can't have fun if you're not safe and you get hurt. So, you know, take a safe step and 
and learn and then you can always have fun and just a, a quick scenario like perfect example is back home in middle tennessee they have like an indoor dirt bike race once a year it's in january well seeing how we're just south of nashville there's lots and lots of people and there's tons of people that have a dirt bike in the shed that used to ride a lot or plan on riding a lot and they might not ride a lot now people that race the racing requires you to wear all the gear and you're going to have a, a certain amount of skill. So it's not really as much pressure towards them as it is newcomers or people that just don't do it that often. So in that race, there's always a record amount of people getting hurt because it's just a, it's probably 70% of people just happen to have a dirt bike in the shed. They're rusty, but they'll just throw it together and make it all work. Well, you can, but it it's just being rusty on the skills. And another little point of info, like, the two most dangerous holidays of the year are Memorial Day and 4th of July. Memorial Day is the first, you know, official outdoor holiday. Everybody just wants to run out and ride. So it's very dangerous. You know, you just need to be careful and be aware of your surroundings. And 4th of July, of course, is another one. And then Labor Day coming up is another one. It's like kind of the ending of the season. So I guess everyone needs to be just very aware of your surroundings and just, just be careful. Um, there's a lot of things that can be prevented just from, being careful and thinking about things and wearing your helmet and knowing how to operate is the first two. Yeah. I really appreciate you saying that for sure. Every measure you take from a safety standpoint is money and time well spent. No doubt about it. Um, I, I wanted to ask you, you touched on something relating to uh, dirt wheels. Uh, you mentioned Keith at UTV sports mag. Uh, we're going to see you out at Utah at the first of October. I want to say it's like the first weekend of October. They're doing the trail hero thing. He texted me about it last year and it just didn't, it didn't work out. So I, I have some stuff in the works as far as an adventure ride basically around the country. And that's, that's basically me going to different locations, riding for a couple of days and, and just filming it and showing different awesome locations. Um, we all know tons of locations and I can't do all of them in one run. I'd be out there for three months, but it'll be a, a one month long trip to where I hit different locations and basically make a loop around the country. Unfortunately, with the planning of Jim, um, Travis now runs Jim Connor, uh, Ken blocks videos where he's slashing tires and stuff like that, you know, running the crap out of stuff. So with Travis basically taking over Jim Connor, um, I'll be part of building some of that stuff. And the Jim Connor thing is kind of in the air. A lot of it because of what's going on in public, some of it on what's going on, with the cars being built, you know, some of it in the locations. So at the end of the day, like if he calls me to build something, I have to do that first. I just hope it doesn't line up in that same time frame. Um, ideally, I was going to try to do my my loop trip around the country in September, October. Uh, it might have to be pushed back to October, November, and be lining it straight to St. George. Really puts me midways. I have to go one way or the other. And to make a full circle, it's going to be hard, but I mean, it, it's nothing but diesel and time, you know, we'll just drive it out. But yeah, I'm going to try to make it this year. Uh, he gave me the invite and he gave me um, the dates and I watched it on Amazon Prime the other day. Uh, awesome movie. Uh, good personality. It, goes, it shows a lot of good terrain and just a good mindset. Um, pretty awesome movie. And I'd love to be part of it again or actually be part of it for a first time. So we'll just have to kind of wait and see how it all plays out. Well, I, you know, coming from a West Coaster, I, I can tell you right now, it'd be awesome to see you out at some of these events out here. You know, you got that one down there in Hurricane. We got um, UTV Takeover in Coos Bay. That's one not to be missed. It's, uh, I mean, you get to rub elbows with so many end users, so many uh, enthusiasts, and it, it becomes just basically a party on the Oregon coast. And it's it's a vast enough area that even 30,000 people out there, you can still find places to go ride safely. And, and let me tell you right now, out of, out of something like 30,000 people that show up to an event like that, there's probably maybe about 500 to about 1,500 that have seen big sand or ridden big sand like at Glamis or done uh, anything like out at Moab. So when, when somebody has eyes on that event and makes it a priority to come into town and check it out and be a part of it. You would not believe how well they're embraced by the Northwest community. It would be so killer to have you guys, have you out there. And, uh, you know, that's, 
obviously COVID affected it, but it is at the end of Ju- it's at the end of June traditionally. Yeah, I, w- I would love to come be part of that. You know, I've done Moab Rally and Rocks a couple times. Uh, I've rode um, uh, what is it? It's in Richfield, Utah. Uh, the ATV UTV Jamboree. It's usually in September time frame. Um, road in Wisconsin, road in a lot of places. Of course, Windrock over here in the east, yeah, Windrock has a spring and a fall jamboree, and then Brimstone has a spring and a fall kind of event concert type thing. You know, the Brimstone is huge, they bring in um, some big country acts, set up a big stage, and the owners of Brimstone amazing people. I love those guys. Um, they do all they can to make it just the very best um, scene they possibly can. Uh, great, great people. Uh, the Brimstone event, I mean, they're pushing, I think the highest crowd ever was 35,000, um, but they probably average around 15 to 20,000. The, the Windrock events are probably around 12 to 15. And then you've got, you know, the Hatfield McCoys. And of course, I, I noticed the UTV takeover, they have like numerous stops. Um, they just had one down in Grundy, Virginia. And uh, a little, uh, the kid that does a lot of jumping and stuff, uh, rustling. He actually came over to the shop here. He got a hold of Travis, and I had met him and his family before. And they come stayed here like two days, basically, just to film some neat, cool content, and then go down to that event and uh, help them work on their little one of his machines a little bit. And then we did some filming. Just awesome, awesome people that just they just love the sport and love doing cool, fun stuff. And then um, yeah, so I'd I'd love to try to hit some of the takeover events and. Um, if I didn't need to work, you know, didn't need to make money, I'd hit them all. But we all got to work. We all got to make money and uh, just kind of plan accordingly. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Definitely keep that Oregon one on your list. It's it's the big one. It's the one where it all started. And it's it's a big, big show. And I got to believe in 2021, if we can put this virus thing to bed, people are just going to be starving to get out of the house and go to something like that. So I would imagine in 2021, it's just going to be incredible. We've been uh, on this for a little while here. I don't want to take up too much of your day. I know you're a busy guy. Um, is there anything we can look forward to uh, coming up in the near future with you guys, uh, whether you personally or with the, the Pastrana group or, or Jim Connor, whatever's going on in your world? Uh, is there anything we can all look forward to? I mean, the, the biggest thing that I have going is, of course, the, the trip around the country, hitting some numerous riding spots. And once that kind of gets dialed in, ironed out, I'll put out a date list of places I go in. And I invite anybody and everybody to come ride. Um, I really don't care what you ride. Just, just come ride, whether you're dirt bikes, UTVs, ATVs, um, a horse, a blazer, whatever, you know, you're, you're more than welcome to come ride with us any given time. I, I just love to share the adventure. And, you know, if, if I'm going somewhere that, that, you know, some people know, you know, y'all show me what's there, you know, I don't need to lead and GPS track everything. You know, I'm glad to follow uh, locals, but you know, definitely that's a big thing. Um, Jim Con is a big thing as far as, uh, Travis and Nitro, that'll, I don't, I know we'll be filming this, this year sometime, but I don't know the time frame of when it'll come out, but all I can say is like the next Jim Connor will be unreal because now Travis is in it. Um, and of course he, he's a driver for a living, so <laughs> he can drive pretty good. Um, yeah, yeah, he's yeah kind- but, but, yeah, he's kind of one of very few people on this planet that could take over that franchise. Yeah, yeah, and him and him and Ken are really close. You know, Ken used to be uh, full owner of DC Shoes, and he, he's still very, very involved with the company. But then he started Jim Connor and Hoonigan and stuff like that. So the guy's just awesome, awesome person, and just loves driving the wheels off of stuff and shredding tires to pieces. You know, that's been a pretty cool uh, storyline, seeing how Ken's taken you know the Hoonigans and then Jim Connor and, and kind of expanded the the media landscape of, of these auto sports and power sports and things like that. Uh, and it's really cool to see Pastrana kind of take that reign and um, kind of take it into the next evolution of what that could be. Um, it's pretty cool to see kind of just, we're, we're so used to in our, in, in kind of like the corporate world to see things just kind of live and die. Like they just get carried in that one direction and by one company or one person or one personality or whatever. And uh, it's really cool to see in a sport and a community that's so giving uh, to see that move into the corporate world and see the corporate side of it. Say, hey, this is our our reign has has been here, and now it's time to see that torch 
go to the next group of, of people that can take it to the next iteration or the next version or the next uh, uh, demographic. And I think that's that's pretty cool. Um, looking uh, at what you're doing with this this national loop and, and everything that's going on, where can people follow you? Where can people you know find these updates, these details? And uh, just in general, how can they find you online? Yeah, so like all of all of my social media type stuff is labeled the same as Nitro and then Redneck, R-E-D-N-E-K, Hubert, H-U-B-E-R-T. So that's Instagram, Facebook, and my YouTube, all three of that. Uh, actually, today's, today's a Tuesday. Uh, so today will be my Can-Am Tech Tuesday where I, I show an install of, you know, one of their parts. And then on Thursdays, I do a Super H-U-B Dirt Therapy Thursday where whether it's parts or riding or whatever. Um, just different companies that I work with, but it's saying show what they have, but also show the way I do things, the way I think put things together. Uh, I kind of break it down pretty simple as far as the install of things to where sometimes the instructions can be a little, a little complex. And I'll actually, sometimes I put stuff together before I even video it and then pull it back apart just to know how a quicker way to do it. Cause you know, all of us mechanically based people, we, we kind of like to pride on, not using the instructions, but at the same time, we need to speak at them every once in a while. Well, great. Um, you know, it's been super exciting to have you on the podcast. I know that I followed you for a long time on, on what you're doing. Um, and it's really nice to, you know, see a personality that's portrayed on maybe media uh, be the same personality that you get to talk to face to face. And, uh, you know, with, with how big the personalities are on the show and how big, you know, some of the, the craziness that goes on, it's nice to know that, uh, you know, the people behind the story are genuinely those people that you see and, and that you get to talk to and interact with. And it's great to hear the stories of you getting out and traveling and, and doing these expeditions and stuff like that. Cause that's all, you know, what interests us, what, what we're interested in, uh, really connects, basically you to the community at, at large. And I think that's really awesome to see that. Um, and it's been a great, uh, great time to have you on the show. Yeah, it, it, it's amazing. I thank y'all a lot for, you know, allowing me to come be part of the show and just kind of tell my little story. And yeah, I mean, if, it, if anybody sees me or, or any of us Nitro people out in public and you want to say, I don't, don't be shy. Don't be nervous. Like I walk around and I don't look people in the eyes because if you do, <laughs> they'll, usually run straight to you. But I, mean, I just walk around and you hear people, I've heard people say stuff, just come say hi. I mean, at the end of the day, we're just regular people that do what we love and we're happy to be lucky enough to make it into a job. Um, but we're just normal people. You know, we, we break things, you know, we fix things, we eat and drink just like everybody else, you know, <laughs> but uh, I really, I really appreciate it. A lot of good stories, and I can't wait to hear and see more stories develop over uh, the course of the year and, and next year. Uh, hopefully next year will be pretty epic for all of us, and uh, uh, looking forward to seeing you on the trails uh, here this fall. Sounds good. If y'all ever want to come out east, let me know. I've got I've got a machine y'all can drive around. <laughs> Sounds like a plan to me. Uh, all right. Well, uh, that's it for this episode of the Off-Road Podcast. Uh, on behalf of Ian, Hubert, and I, peace. Peace.